This presentation is part of a curriculum developed collaboratively by the following partners through a grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We hope you'll use this presentation, share it, reuse it, and adapt it for your own purposes. Hello, I'm Sandra McIntyre, the director of the Mountain West Digital Library, a service hub of the Digital Public Library of America. This presentation, Digital Reformatting and File Management, was created by Sheila McAllister and me. Sheila is the director of the Digital Library of Georgia, also a service hub of the DPLA. We use the collective knowledge of all the service hub managers that participated in the DPLA's Public Library Partnerships project during 2014 and 2015 with the guidance of Frankie Abbott, the project manager for the project. In this presentation, we will introduce you to the basics of reformatting with an eye to the needs of librarians, archivists, and curators who work with cultural heritage materials and who want to make them available online. We'll start with, what is reformatting? Well, when we think about reformatting, most of us call it digitization, and what we call digitization involves taking a tangible object, an analog item, if you will, and turning it into a computer file, a digital object. But reformatting is more than that. It also can include taking a digital file that's in one format already, a digital format, and converting it into another digital format, usually done for better access to the item and for longer term uh, sustainability of how that item is stored. Our philosophy of reformatting includes several important points that we hope you'll keep in mind during this presentation. First, make sure you reformat once. Less handling on the materials leads to less wear on them. And it's really important to think about doing it right the first time. Uh, take the time to do it right so that you don't have to keep repeating this time-consuming process. Also keep in mind to digitize for the future. Make sure you have a high enough quality that you don't need to come back later and re-digitize because the first time you did it, you did it at too low a quality. Also remember that reformatting costs money. Every time you reformat, you're using equipment, you're using someone's time, and you're taking up storage space on a server. You want to be sure that what you have decided to do is justifiable in terms of the cost and that you're not doing things multiple times in, in multiple formats. It's not really rocket science to do reformatting. Uh, you, anyone can learn the kinds of things that we're going to give you an overview of today. But keep in mind that there are many considerations involved, there are lots of variables, and that different kinds of materials require different sorts of processes and hit, tend to hit different sorts of snags during the process. There's no good digitization for dummies book out there, um, but there, because there's so much to learn over so much time. But we can give you an overview here. We can show you what's important to keep an eye out for. And then we want to encourage you to pursue all the support options you can before deciding, it to, deciding to do it yourself. In other words, if, you, if there is already someone out there that can help you with all of these aspects of reformatting, take advantage of that rather than learning and going up a steep learning curve yourself. Finally, in this preliminary overview about what is reformatting, we want to make sure you understand that digitization does not equal preservation. Sometimes people confuse the two. Digitization is part of the ongoing digital preservation process. In other words, you have to create a digital file before you can preserve it. But just digitizing something and having a digital file doesn't mean you've preserved it adequately. Digital preservation is a long-term active process. It has a lot of complicated stages and for many institutions they're still involved in working out what that workflow looks like and what all the stages are and the robustness for down the road. So remember that this is just part of that overall process. Also digitization doesn't replace proper physical preservation of the analog content. Please don't digitize something and then toss the item in the trash can because now you have a digital file and you don't need that, that anymore. It's not true. You really need to also have appropriate uh, preservation of physical items. So now we'll take a look at the reformatting process. 
And basically this breaks down into about six steps. We're going to cover each of these six steps in turn. So first you create the master file, the uncompressed high quality file, the thing that's really going to store all of the bits and bytes involved in the digitization of that item. So for analog content, the stuff that you're taking from analog and, convert and turning into to digital, you'll be scanning it or sampling it. For born digital content, for that second category, for things that are already digitized that were, say, created as digital files in the first place, you might be doing some conversion processes to create a new master file in a new format that's more sustainable over the long term. Secondly, you're going to want to name the file in a consistent way so you can find it later among the hundreds or thousands of other files that you're going to accumulate over time. Thirdly, you're going to perform quality control, which usually involves some editing and fixing up of the different digital files. Fourthly, you'll save the master file on stable long-term storage. Fifth, you'll create a derivative or access file, and we'll talk more about what that means in a minute. And then finally, you'll share the access files as needed for use, reuse, and adaptation. So that first step, creating the master or archival file. It involves uh, having a certain amount of equipment. And there's a lot that you can learn about this, but basically it breaks down into some of these categories. For many people, it involves, first of all, a flatbed scanner, sometimes with an adapter so that you can use that flatbed scanner with negatives or you can use that flatbed scanner with slides. But there also are specialized scanners for those purposes and others. Um, and many digitization centers in our network have specialized scanners, including things like an overhead scanner with a camera way over on top of an item that gives you a lot of control over how that item is filmed. High-speed book scanners, which will allow uh, delicate materials even to be scanned at a high rate of speed um, as, the, as the equipment turns the, the book pages uh, at a pretty high rate. Microfilm scanners, specifically designed for scanning microfilm. And then slide scanners. While you can use an adapter for slides on your flatbed scanner, there are specialized scanners that you can feed slides into that will take care of them in bulk and do a fantastic job. So think about the kinds of equipment that might be suited for your needs. And then also, and this is something that some people forget, remember to have a good computer with an adjustable monitor. You're going to want to make sure that you can do some color calibration, for example, and you need an adjustable monitor for that and something that has a high enough processing speed and capacity to take care of the digitization of the material. There are a lot of standards and best practices to follow, and this presentation won't go into detail about most of that, but you should know that there's some very good compendia of um, those standards and best practices, and we'll give two of them here um, related to images, and the first one is the FAGI, Technical Guidelines for Digitizing Cultural Heritage Materials. Um, you can find out about all of these different sorts of things in this extensive document, which gives excellent guidance on how to maintain the different aspects of best practices that you're going to want to have. There also is another slightly older but still really good document um, originally put together by BCR. Uh, we have um, stored it here in a location. It's no longer being maintained. It dates back to about 2008. But it, it also describes and gives a lot of great examples, visual examples, of the kinds of things you're going to want to think about and the impact of different practices. Um, if you don't observe them, what might happen to the quality of your digital file? So a couple of the things that these sorts, these uh, these uh, guidelines will help you with are things like resolution. And I did want to, we wanted to stress this to say that you really want to scan at the best resolution that you can afford to store. There is no absolute on resolutions. It's always a balancing process. How much space is it going to take up? How much time do you want to wait to get this higher resolution scan? But you're not going to want to go back later and have to rescan to get a better resolution later. So think about getting it at the best resolution you can afford to store. And for different types of materials, here are some of the pixels per inch minimums uh, that you'll want to maintain in that. 
you're also going to want to make sure that you pay attention to color. It's so easy to change the color on materials in the scanning process, so make sure your monitor and scanner are calibrated and check that the final scan has the same colors as the original object when you view it on screen. Then when, you're, when, you've, when you've done paying attention to these best practices, you're going to want to save that file. And for images, you're going to want to, for all those types mentioned, you're going to want to save in the TIFF format. Use the three-letter extension .tif at the end of your file name and make sure that you save this uncompressed, high-quality version in a safe place. For audio, here are some of the characteristics that you're going to want to pay attention to in terms of what uh, rate and what sampling rate and what depth you're going to want to um, digitize at for audio. And with audio, you're going to want to save it in either the WAV format or an AIFF format. There is an excellent document done by the Consortium of Academic and Research Libraries in Illinois, CARLI, called Guidelines for the Creation of Digital Collections, Digitization Best Practices for Audio. And we found this to be an excellent and succinct uh, summary of, some, of how to proceed with digitizing audio. And then with the video, there are two um, items that work in tandem, again from FADG. Uh, this is their audiovisual working group the digitization of motion picture film and the creating and archiving of born digital video. You can find all of those FADGI AV guidelines at the address given on the screen. And now we'll move into file naming. So for all of these files, now that you've created the master file in the format that you want, typically an uncompressed, high quality, high resolution format, you're going to want to name that file in a way that helps you to find it later and that makes sense for your system. Different organizations will find a different way to do this. Here are some guidelines that seem to work for most groups to come up with something that they can manage over time. First, you'll always want to have your file names end in a three-letter extension that reveals the format of the file. So, JPG, GIF, etc. Um, use only lowercase alphanumeric characters, and if you need them, underscores and hyphens. But do not put spaces in your file name because many systems don't know how to handle that. Many file management systems on different uh, servers don't know what to do with the space. So restrict yourself to alpha characters, numeric characters, underscores, and hyphens. The shorter the file name, the better. You want something that's meaningful, but you don't want it to go on for many, many characters if you can help it. Something that means something to you is great. Also, think about the order of display. When you're looking at something in a, a bunch of files in a file folder, you're going to want them to display in an order that makes sense to you. Um, you're not going to want to have to find things in different kinds of random order. You're going to want to be able to go right to it and find it. So think about that order of the display as you're naming your files. One thing that helps for this is to keep the same number of characters in each file name. Of course, you'll want to be consistent across your file naming system. That's the most important thing. And then we recommend that you work with your service hub system. If your service hub always has a particular file naming convention, it's going to be in your interest to conform to that system. So there are a couple of methods here for how you can proceed. The easiest, the one that doesn't take much thought at all, is to just use an ad existing identifier that someone has already assigned that particular photograph or item. So, for example, if a photograph was designated 55-JBC-2, uh, when you scan it, it makes sense to name it 55-JBC-2.tiff. Um, similarly, maybe you have um, accession file number 998, and it's the second letter in that file. And then you, when you create a PDF of that letter, you might want to use that accession number. Or if something is stored on a particular archival tape, maybe it makes sense to name it from that uh, location. Whatever makes sense internally, you can use. Another method is if you want to perhaps make something consistent across a lot of different files from different sources, they haven't been named consistently, et cetera, you can create your, new, your own new scheme. And we suggest that you come up with two to four lowercase letters followed by two to four digits. Um, and you may need even more digits depending on how many items you have. For example, if, you have, if you're going to have more than 999 items, you're going to need more than three digits. You're going to need at least four. So 
at least as many digits as the highest number expected. And then you can use underscores or hyphens as desired for readability. For example, if you have a Georgia Railroad Photographs collection, you might want to name the files GRP-001, GRP-002, etc. A slight twist on this method too is if you have multi-page documents, like say you have a letter that's four pages, you might want to add a letter at the end of the file name so that they stay associated together. In this example, all these are part of a letter that's called BR035, but you've got pages A, B, and C, etc. Okay, once you've named the file, you want to think about what your quality control looks like and your storage. So, remember to review your own work, make sure you check it over, but also be sure to have someone else check over your work too. We all are, are guilty of not being able to see something after a while when we've worked on it too long, so it's really helpful to have somebody else check over your work. Also remember if you're spot checking items that you've worked on. Yeah. Be sure not to just pick items at the beginning to spot check or just items at the end. Pick a sampling throughout the entire list of items. And this is particularly important to do if more than one person has worked on the whole set of items to make sure you're being consistent in your quality control across the different people who have been working on them. Many times when you do some quality control after uh, the digitizing has happened, you'll find that you need to edit that medium a little bit and be able to take it into some editing software, tweak it, take care of some, some problems that may have occurred during the scanning process. And these are problems that could be due to an error that was done during the scanning process or they could just be things that happen randomly as, as a part of any kind of digitization that you're going to be doing. So for your images, for example, uh, be willing to take them into Photoshop, look at de-skewing the item. If the camera wasn't dead on uh, facing the item, you're going to have it be a little bit of a trapezoidal image. You're going to want to de-skew that. There may be some speckling involved with dust particles that got on the page. Don't despeckle things that are naturally part of the item, however, if you have an, um, a 16th century book and it has a coffee stain or, or some, other item, some other thing on it, you're going to want to leave that there. Be willing to make some color adjustments if there were some problems with the color, but again, don't falsify what the color looks like on the page. If the paper's brown, leave it showing as brown. Uh, don't try to whiten that. And then finally, for many items, particularly text items, you're going to want to sharpen the image to do this, this artificial um, uh, way of changing the image so that it looks a little clearer. Um, and this can be helpful with old or dimly printed items, uh, particularly text items. For audio editing, you're going to look for distortions, dropouts of the audio, anything that's changed the quality of it. And then for video editing, particularly you're going to want to look again for things that distort it like artifacts, that sort of explosion thing that seems to happen or where the image breaks up for a split second and then reforms together, um, or moiré patterns that happen on top of the image because of perhaps insufficient resolution in the video over a pattern. So it gives kind of a watery, um, patterny look to the image. And you're going to want to check for that and make sure that you've got sufficient quality on that video. Then take your file, once you're happy with it, the quality looks good, place it in secure storage. And for different organizations, secure storage means different things. Um, it may be as simple as a hard drive for you, but hopefully you have better access to higher quality data storage than that, and that has backups, maybe even tape backups. You're going to want to make sure you have, in any case, multiple versions of each file with at least one of those versions in a different location in case there happens to be some kind of natural disaster in your location that would take out all of your backups in that location. Take, take it at least weekly to another location. Then you leave those archival files alone. Don't access the archival files unless necessary. Preserve them, protect them, um, and then, and not part of this presentation, but part of what you're going to want to think about down the road is you're going to want to plan for long-term digital preservation of those files. Some kind of process that ensures the integrity of the digital file over time and the migration of those files to new formats as new formats become available and in use. 
So you've got your wonderful storage file, your arch, I'm sorry, your wonderful archival file, this high quality master, but who, how are you going to make that accessible to people online? You've got this very protected file, but you're going to need now to create something that is accessible easily online by users, and that's called the access file. We also call these derivative files because they're files that are created from the master file. They're derived from that original file. Their purpose is for the quick viewing online. We don't want to wait people wait, make people wait for the, the long downloading of those really large TIFF files. Um, we want something that they can get access to quickly. So it's used for web access, for little thumbnails. Um, people can use it for easy printing to include in low quality publications or informal publications. Um, so you want to give people something that they can see online that downloads quickly and that is useful in certain ways and in other ways they would have to come to you for the access file that higher I mean sorry the master file that higher quality version but derivative files are very useful for access copies and you're going to want to derive that from your master file Derivative files are typically kept in slightly different formats. Um, you can use GIF files, GIF formats for thumbnails, JPEGs for medium and high resolution images for web delivery. This is very common for photograph quality images. Or in the case of documents, we have multiple pages. Uh, you may want to put it into a PDF format. Keep in mind, however, that PDF is a proprietary format, and if you do use that, you're requiring your end users to have Adobe Acrobat Reader software on their computers in order to be able to open it. And then you're going to want to upload that access file to a place where people can find it and use it most productively. Usually, for most people, this is a digital assets management system, a DAMS, and that can either be via a local installation or via an installation in the cloud, i.e. over the internet. You can also upload access files for other use on HTML web pages, uh, and many people enjoy creating online exhibits in dedicated exhibit creation software like Omeka, and this can be another very powerful use for your access file. Now finally, we've gone through the process, we've talked about how to reformat your file, but now I want to talk to you about something very important for everyone to think about, and that is, how do you, do you want to do this yourself, or do you want to work with a hub or a commercial vendor? So we've got this section on use a hub, keep it in-house, or outsource. So we'd like to encourage you to use a DPLA service hub. In most cases, your hub has exactly what you need. They have staff with experience in managing digital libraries and archives. In other words, they know your use case. They know what you need to have done for them. They know how you manage your materials and what you want to do with them, who your audience is, and how you want to serve them. They have the digitization equipment and software for the most common reformatting needs, and they usually know how to provide access to specialized services. So if they can't do it, they know someone who can. They have ways um, to do file storage and backup, typically at a high level. Um, they can maintain the security of, the, of your images and video and audio over time. They have workflows that have been well worked out from years of practice using the best practices in the field. And often, very commonly, they have reasonable prices or they can help you with finding funding in order to pay for their services for digitization. So we'd like to encourage you to use a DPLA service hub. These hubs exist around the country. We hope that you'll turn to them and take your, your, your cultural heritage materials to them and work closely with them to get exactly what you need. However, there may be times when using a DPLA service hub isn't exactly what you want, and there are other options. A lot of people like to consider parts of their, their reformatting operations to be kept in-house. So you'll want to consider reformatting, reformatting in-house when what you need is to develop your staff skills more. You want people to actually have to work on this, to work through the best practices and to learn and become very familiar with it. Or if you want them to main, or you want to maintain close control over your materials. If your if your materials are just too delicate 
are too priceless to be removed from your premises, even under the careful controls for transportation and, and uh, maintaining the materials while under the, the uh, control of the service hub, you may have to keep it in-house. Um, that, can, that can be something that will make you consider this. You may want to maintain close control over the operations. There may be things that your materials may be so fragile that you don't want certain operations done on them, and so you want to really control exactly what's, what happens to your materials. You don't want maybe a glass plate to be pressed down on top of a book because it's too fragile. So maybe you want to be sure that the, that doesn't happen. And then finally, if you need to adjust things during the course of your project because you're learning as you go or because different sorts of materials are coming up in the project, you may again want to keep it in-house so that you can make those adjustments. And then the final option is to consider outsourcing to a vendor. Um, and this can be in your interest under certain conditions, um, particularly if you need a high volume production operation. So if you have tens or even hundreds of thousands of pages that you want digitized in a very standard way and you know a vendor that is very used to doing that particular high volume operation, it can really be in your interest to go to a vendor. One example for that would be the digitization of newspapers. There are some vendors that are just extremely knowledgeable about that and can do it quickly, do a fast turnaround and give you good prices on that high volume. You probably won't want to outsource to a vendor if you have some of those earlier considerations mentioned in the previous slides, but when you have something really standard, high volume, and you need a quick turnaround, a vendor can come in really handy. We have some suggestions for you about what you ask of that vendor. Think about asking them all of these questions before undertaking a particular project with them. Know what hardware and software they use and that those things are adequate to this project. Do they have quality control procedures in place that make sense or are they going to rely on you to kick back errors? What kind of turnaround time can they give you? Will they do delivery and pick up or are you going to have to go over to their operation repeatedly? Do they have environmental controls in place to take care of the um, kinds of equipment and materials that they're using? Or will you be able to work with a specific project manager who understands your needs and what your audience will want to see out of this project? Do they have references for similar projects that they've done for other clients or customers? Can you see them? And then probably last, even though you may have thought of it first, what are their prices? And you'll want to understand their pricing structure really thoroughly. Do the prices change at certain breakpoints? If you do over a thousand scans, do you get a price break, etc.? And then when you're working with a vendor, be sure to remember some of these guidelines. You're going to need to be a little flexible. You're going to want to work with the vendor and learn the vendor's way of operating. Have one person and one person only from your organization be the vendor contact so that you're getting consistent information that's always passed through to the vendor. Be sure to respond quickly to any vendor questions. Make sure you work out your plan for quality control, not just understanding what the vendor is going to do for QC, but what you're going to do to assure that they are meeting all your needs as the materials come back to you. When you have issues with what the vendor is doing, communicate those issues early on. Give them an opportunity to adapt and adjust and improve. And then when the project's done, do a thorough analysis so that you can improve for the future. So we hope you'll make the right choice for you on any given reformatting project of either working with a DPLA service hub, keeping part of it in-house for yourself, or working with a vendor, or any combination of the above that works for you and your project. So this is the end of our reformatting presentation. If you're working with a DPLA service hub, you might want to take some questions now to the representative of that hub find out how they can meet your needs, and ask the kinds of questions that you need to ask to be more fully informed about how to manage your reformatting and plan for the future for sharing your cultural heritage materials online.